Okay, so I, so we're starting with chapter 14, I think, right? Gluttony is a delusion of the eyes, which receives in moderation, but wants to gobble everything at once. Satiety in food is the father of fornication. Mortification of the stomach is an agent of purity. He who fondles a lion often tames it, but he who coddles the body makes it still wilder. The Jew rejoices on Sabbaths and feast days, and a monk who is a glutton on Saturdays and Sundays. He counts beforehand the days till Easter, and he prepares the food for it several days in advance. The slave of his belly calculates with what dishes he will celebrate the feast, but the servant of God considers with what graces he may be enriched. That's a good one to remember, especially long about mm, the end of Lent. <laughs> Please. If a stranger comes, the slave of the stomach is moved to love entirely from gluttony, and he regards laxity for himself as consolation for his brother. When others are present, he deems it right to allow himself wine, and thinking to hide his virtue, he becomes a slave of passion. Often, vanity proves an enemy of gluttony, and they quarrel between themselves for the wretched monk as for a purchased slave. The one urges him to relax, while the other proposes that he should make his virtue triumph. The wise monk will shun both, at the right time shaking off each passion by the other. As long as the flesh is still lusty, let us observe temperance at all times in every place. When it has been pacified, which I do not suppose is possible this side of the grave, then let us hide our accomplishment. I have seen aged priests bewitched by the demons, and on the feasts they gave their blessing to young men, not under their direction, to use wine and all the rest. If those who give permission have good witness in the Lord, are spiritual, then let us also permit ourselves within limits. But if they are negligent, let us not give a thought to their blessing, especially when we are in the actual heat of the struggle with our flesh. Evagrius, afflicted by an evil spirit, imagined himself to be the wisest of the wise, both in thought and expression. But he was deceived, poor man, and proved to be the most foolish of fools in this among other things. For he says, when our soul desires different foods, then confine it to bread and water. To prescribe this is like saying to a child, go up the whole ladder in one stride. And so, rejecting his rule, let us say, when our soul desires different foods, it is demanding what is proper to its nature. Therefore, let us also use cunning against our unscrupulous foe. And unless a very severe conflict is on us, or amends for falls, let us for a while only deny ourselves fattening foods, then heating foods, and only then what makes our food pleasant. If possible, give your stomach satisfying and digestible food so as to satisfy its insatiable hunger by sufficiency, and so that we may be delivered from excessive desire as from a scourge by quick assimilation. If we look into the matter, we shall find that most of the foods which inflate the stomach also excite the body. Laugh at the demon who, after supper, suggests that you should take your meal later in future. For the next day at the ninth hour, he will change the arrangements of the previous day. Okay. Um, in, many, uh, in many monasteries, especially in ancient times, um, they, there was only one meal served, and it was at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, um, and especially on fast days. Um, and so... Um, uh, there's, it talks a lot about three o'clock in the afternoon is the ninth hour. So um, talks a lot. There are a lot of references to uh, three, to eating at the ninth hour or not being, you know, or waiting and um, and getting very hungry at the ninth hour and you can't wait a, another minute and that kind of that kind of thing. So um, that's that's the ancient that's the ancient pattern. <coughs> One kind of temperance is suitable for those who behave irreproachably, and another for those subject to weaknesses. For the former, a movement in the body is a signal for restraint, but the latter are affected by such movements without relief or relaxation till their very death and end. The former always wish to preserve peace of mind, and the latter propitiate God by spiritual lamentation and contrition. The perfect find their time of gladness and consolation in the attainment of dispassion in all things. The warrior ascetic enjoys the heat of the battle, 
but the slave of the passions revels in the feast of feasts and the triumph of triumphs. The heart of gluttons dreams only of food and eatables, but the heart of those who weep dreams of judgment and castigation. Master your stomach before it masters you, and then you are sure to control yourself with the aid of shame. Those who have fallen into the horrible gulf know what I have said, but men who are eunuchs have not experienced this. Let us prune the stomach by thought of the future fire. For some who were servants of their stomach have cut their members right off and died a double death. If we go into the matter, we shall find that it is the stomach alone that is the cause of all human shipwreck. The mind of a faster prays soberly, but the mind of an intemperate person is filled with impure idols. Satiety of the stomach dries the tear springs, but the stomach when dried produces these waters. He who cherishes his stomach and hopes to overcome the spirit of fornication is like one who tries to put out a fire with oil. By stinting the stomach, the heart is humbled, but by pleasing the stomach, the mind becomes proud. Keep watch over yourself early in the morning, at midday, and for an hour before taking food, and you will realize the value of fasting. In the morning, through thought leaps and runs from one thing to another. With the approach of the sixth hour of the day, it becomes somewhat quieter, and by sunset, it is completely at peace. Stint your stomach, and you will certainly lock your mouth, because the tongue is strained by, strengthened by a lot of food. Struggle with all your might against the stomach and restrain it with all sobriety. If you labor a little, the Lord also will soon work with you. Leather bottles get greater capacity if they are supple, but if they are left in neglect, they do not hold so much. He who burdens his stomach with food distends his inside, but he who wars with his stomach contracts it. And when the inside is contracted, then we cannot take much, and for the future we become fasters naturally. Thirst is often stopped by thirst, but it is difficult to cut off hunger by hunger, and even impossible. When the stomach overcomes you, tame it by labors. And if this is impossible owing to weakness, struggle with it by vigil. If the eyes become heavy, take up manual labor. But if sleep is not upon you, do not touch manual labor, because it is impossible to occupy the mind with God and mammon that is, both with God and manual labor. Know that often a devil settles in the belly and does not let the man be satisfied, even though he has devoured a whole Egypt and drunk a river Nile. But after taking food, this unclean spirit goes away and sends against us the spirit of fornication, telling him of our condition and saying, catch, catch, hound him, for when the stomach is full, he will not resist much. With the smile, the spirit of fornication comes, and having bound us hand and foot by sleep, does with us all he pleases, defiling soul and body with its impurities, dreams, and emissions. It is amazing to see the bodiless mind defiled and darkened by the body, and likewise the immaterial spirit purified and refined through clay. If you have promised Christ to go by the straight and narrow way, restrain your stomach, because by pleasing it and enlarging it, you break your contract. Attend and you will hear him who says, spacious and broad is the way of gluttony that leads to the perdition of fornication and many there who go in by it because narrow is the gate and hard is the way of fasting that leads to the life of purity and few there are who go in by it. The prince of demons is the fallen Lucifer and the prince of passions is gluttony. When sitting at a table laden with food, remember death and judgment. For even so, you will only check the passion slightly. In taking drink, do not cease to imagine the vinegar and gall of your Lord, and you will certainly either be temperate or you will sigh and humble your mind. Do not be deceived. You will not be delivered from Pharaoh, and you will not see the heavenly Passover, unless you continually eat bitter herbs and unleavened bread. And bitter herbs, this is the coercion and pain of fasting and unleavened bread, this is a mind that is not puffed up. Let this be knit to your breathing. The word of him who says, but I, when demons troubled me, put on sackcloth and humbled my soul with fasting, and my prayer stuck to the bosom of my soul. Fasting is the coercion of nature and the cutting out of everything that delights the palate, the prevention of lust, the uprooting of bad thoughts, deliverance from dreams, purity of prayer, the light of the soul, the guarding of the mind, deliverance from blindness, the door of compunction, 
humble sighing, glad contrition, a lull and chatter, a means to silence, a guard of obedience, lightning of sleep, health of body, agent of dispassion, remission of sins, the gate of paradise and its delight. Let us ask this foe, or rather the supreme chief of our misfortunes, this door of passions, this fall of Adam, this, ru this ruin of Esau, this destruction of the Israelites, this laying naked of Noah's shame, this betrayer of Gomorrah, this reproach of Lot, this death, of the sons of Eli, this guide to impurity. Let us ask him, for whom is he born? Who are his offspring? Who crushes him? And who finally destroys him? Tell us, tormentor of all mortals, who has brought all with the gold of greed? How did you get access to us? And what do you usually produce after your coming? And what is the manner of your departure from us? And gluttony, annoyed by these insults, raving with fury against us and foaming replies, why are you who are my underlings, overwhelming me with reproaches? How are you trying to get separated from me? I am bound to you by nature. The door for me is the nature of foods. The cause of my insatiability is habit. The foundation of my passion is repeated habit, insensibility of the soul and forgetfulness of death. How do you seek to learn the names of my offspring? If I count them, they will be more in number than the sand, but learn at least the names of my firstborn and beloved children. My firstborn son is a minister of fornication. The second after him is hardness of heart, and the third is sleepiness. From me proceed a sea of bad thoughts, waves of filth, depths of unknown and unnamed impurities. My daughters are laziness, talkativeness, familiarity in speech, jesting, facetiousness, contradiction, a stiff neck, obstinacy, disobedience, sensibility, captivity, conceit, audacity, boasting, after which follows impure prayer, whirling of thoughts, and often unexpected and sudden misfortunes, with which is closely bound to spare the most evil of all my daughters. The remembrance of falls resists me, but does not conquer me. The thought of death is always hostile to me, but there is nothing among men that destroys me completely. He who has received the Comforter prays to him against me, and the Comforter, when appealed to, does not allow me to act passionately. But those who have not tasted his gift inevitably seek their pleasure in my sweetness. The victory over this vice is a courageous one. He who is able, let him hasten to dispassion and to the highest degree of chastity. So, questions? One of the things that he um, talked a lot about in here was temperance. And um, there are a couple different aspects of that. One is sobriety. And um, it, gluttony in, embraces also not only the use of food, but the use of, of alcohol and other substances. Um, uh, the tradition has, has no allowance for use, using other substances. So whether it be tobacco or marijuana or cocaine or anything like that, it's, that's nothing that the, tr the tradition um, validates. Um, use of alcohol, of course, has been, been there since the beginning. Um, and so uh, uh, it's, but drunkenness is never acceptable. And, and it is never, um, well, it's simply never acceptable. Yeah. Is uh, drunkenness another kind of, it, I guess I was, I was going to say drunkenness is another form of gluttony, but it's yeah. gluttony of, of alcoholic drink. Right, right. But uh, when it says, um, when, when, when it, in the scripture it's talking about that drunkenness is talking about gluttony, isn't it? Mm -hmm. it? It's not the drinking of alcohol, it's the over-consuming of the substance. It's the over-consuming of, of the substance, yeah. Um, in order to make one marry or, or, or worse. Yeah, exactly. Um, but the other aspect of also that, and this is, um, uh, it actually turned into a, uh, um, a kind of motto um, for the Benedictine rule. And that's moderation in all things. Um, and it's, uh, we had a, um, we did the same chapter last night up in DC. And um, 
some of the people were of the opinion that in monastic life, um, everybody was supposed to, you know, just fast to the nth degree, and all they were supposed to do is eat bread and water, and you know. Um, and I have to admit, when I was in my first trip to Jordanville, it was ni 1983, um, and uh, uh, I went up from St. Vladimir's, and they had nothing good to say about Jordanville at the time, um, uh, especially at St. Vladimir's, because there was this, this great rivalry. Um, in, at St. Vladimir's, they didn't think about St. Tikhon's. It was just kind of there. Um, but, uh, but Jordanville was the real rival. And so they said, oh, there's nothing but these nasty old Archimandrites up there. And, and um, uh, the uh, uh, lunch was, was a, a bit of a surprise. Um, and I hadn't been to Russia by that time, so I didn't quite know. So at lunch, they served kasha, which is buckwheat. Um, who's, who's had buckwheat? OK. It's interesting. Yeah. Not too many. Not, yeah, not too many. Just once at St. Nicholas Cathedral last Friday. OK. <laughs> yeah, not, too Amer not too many Americans do buckwheat, except in pancakes or something. But, um, they had buckwheat. They had bread. And they had milk that was still warm out of the cow. Mm -hmm. And the milk was good. Buckwheat was awful. <laughs> I, don't like, I, don't like, I don't like buckwheat. And the brothers at Valam used to make fun of me. Um, it's called it's called Grichovka um, uh, 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 in in Russian, but I used to say no. Yet it's a Grichovka. <laughs> it's a little sin. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, so they made sure that their visitors uh, were well exercised in fasting at Jordanville, so anyway. Um, but, but the point is, and in monastic practice, throughout the Orthodox world, um, in monasteries the food is, is, is fresh and it's well prepared and it's plentiful. And you, eat, you generally eat as much as you need. You're not, not supposed to eat as much as you might want, but you can eat as much as you need. And it used to be uh, for the seminarians, uh, go, go, who lived at the seminaries, they would go and visit monasteries and they would especially go at mealtime so that they could, they could eat at the monastery because they'd be starving to death because all they would have would like, be like buckwheat and bread um, and she, which is cabbage soup, she akasha. And um, so, um, uh, which, whereas at the monastery it would be a full spread and so... And that's normal. And it, depend, it depends, it doesn't depend on the culture, the Greeks, the Russians, the Serbs, the Bulgarians, it's all, it's all the same thing. Um, food's different, of course. But um, the point is, you eat, eat as much as you need, and, and, and that's it. But in, and in moderation, um, take everything. Um, uh, and when it's time to fast, then you fast. Um, and, you know, especially in the ancient usage here, on fast days, the fasting, it was not just a change of diet. It was, it was that you didn't, you didn't eat until 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Um, and on non-fast days, you could have something in the morning if you needed to. But fast days. Um, and that's... That's really the ancient, ancient pattern. And of course, that's very similar to Ramadan. Of course, the Muslims got that from us. Um, so. We'll see you Saturday. What's that? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So. Um, yeah. Uh, so what is the original uh, language of the writing? This was Greek. Greek? Yeah. So how do they determine the gender of a word? Is it like the feminine, masculine? Like this is all back to because they were saying how these are my sons, right. list of nouns, and then these are my daughters. 
Is that based Every, on the gender of the noun? Yeah, it's, it's all gender of the noun. In fact, one of the one of the things that's kind of interesting here um, is that it switches genders. Um, one thirty nine. Yeah. Um, so yeah, top of one thirty nine, talking about the stomach. In in this version, um, uh, from whom is she born? Who are her offspring? Who crushes her or gluttony rather? Because and and finally, who destroys her? Um, Okay, Greek. Uh, what is the word for gluttony in Greek? Anybody know? I don't. I don't either. <laughs> um, uh, but in uh, Father uh, Lazarus Moore's translation, it's it's masculine, hmm. right? Who are his off? Who are his offspring? Who crushes him? Who finally destroys him? But in this, so they must have decided that, um, in at least in English, gluttony is uh, is a feminine. <coughs> yeah. The, the um, well, from what I, where, where, where I remember from studying Greek, it's the um, there's some feminine yet declension nouns that are actually masculine, that, but they use the feminine declension. So it's probably from where the confusion comes from is that it can be translated. It's there are some nouns that are that that are masculine, but have the feminine spelling mm -hmm. for the declension, and vice versa. Yeah. So well, it's is is lemargia, and so that's that's definitely a feminine. Hmm. So that's why it switches. No. Yeah. So, um, and I bet gluttony is masculine in English. We've 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 almost we've almost lost declen these the genders of. In, in English, people are using gender for to mean something else, but that's but it has nothing to do with one's sexual orientation. <laughs> you know, that's a total misuse of the word. Yes. Um, so it's feminine in the French as well. In French, okay. Yeah, what about German? Deutsch. Because uh, we generally follow the German. D. Really? Yeah. Interesting. The follow I. Hmm. Uh, old English. <laughs> <laughs> where's, where's Caitlin? So, um, anyway. Okay. Yeah, I have one question. <laughs> gen, uh, gen, you know, the gender doesn't have anything to do with this, uh, with sex. It's just. Like a way of categorizing. Yeah, it's uh, just a way of. It's, it's a way of. It's a way of categorizing okay. certain sets of certain ways of thinking about certain kinds of words. Does it mean one conscience. stronger than the other? Not necessarily. Mm -hmm. I thought it was kind of more like like maybe an arrow would be masculine and like a bowl would be feminine just based on their properties. Never mind. <laughs> I don't know. Um, how, so with the monastic fasting if a monk is fasting to the point of becoming unconscious and weak. Is that considered foolishness? A, it's, yes, it's considered foolishness. And, um, and his abbot would probably whip him. Okay. Um, and St. John Chrysostom did that. Um, and uh, uh, it's a famous story. He, um, he, was, he was young and he was a self-willed ascetic, and so he um, he went into a cave and lived in the cave, and, and he fasted and, until he uh, not only um, could bear, you know, was barely conscious, but but he broke his health, and so it and it did not contribute to his desired lifestyle because his friends came and got him. They took him back to the city. They nursed him back to the to health, and because. He was essentially locked inside. Um, they grabbed him and ordained him, <laughs> which he didn't want. <laughs> so, and if you read the treatise of Saint John Chrysostom on the priesthood, it talks about um, how good, how important it is to run away from such a thing. So, so why is despair considered the most evil out of all? Well, because it, uh, because it, um, 
despair just it, yeah, I, it, it destroys your whole ability to function. Like it's the ultimate giving up. Of yeah, life and, yeah. Drive. And people, um, many people, fall into despair, just commit commit suicide, or they just die. Uh, there's a in the um, in the uh, passion of acedia or achidia, um, there It's this whole uh, spectrum from um, <coughs> boredom and depression to despair. And um, so. So I think that uh, in Christianity that we're told that God is an ultimate love, right? Right. But uh, if uh, you fall for disparity, then it means that you like kind of stop believing. Yeah. To, like you're denying that God is love. Exactly. And that's why you probably want to be heavy sins. Yeah. You're also completely turned in on yourself. Um, and unable to ex- even to accept God. It's like you're blaming uh, God Himself and saying that He's so cruel that He would want to help me. Yep. That's why I'm feeling this way. Yep. Yeah. Hmm. So what else? For there was a reference in there to like. Uh, heating foods, or mm-hmm. I, I assume this means foods that inflame the the passions, and and, I, and of course you notice that when we have our fasting disciplines, that it, it seems that the fathers of the church really hated proteins and lipids, so they mm-hmm. kind of put us on a straight carb diet, which had a reverse caveman diet, and you know I, I mean, maybe that's good for us spiritually, maybe not so good physically. I mean, yeah. how, how does how does this work? Well. Um, uh, of course, back back at this time, um, many people survived on bread, especially the poor. They, um, it was bread and vegetables, and they'd get some kind of meat or fish once in a while. But it was it was very expensive and um, way beyond most of their, and in, and especially people who lived in cities. I mean, they weren't going out fishing, you know. Um, um, so, so meats and meat and, and and even fish was a kind of a, a festive, <laughs> celebratory food, um, and uh, uh, basically people would eat bread and, and vegetables and nuts, Egypt dates things like that in the, in the Middle East um, and olives, and so that that was kind of the the ancient. The ancient diet, of course, the wealthy had what, whatever they wanted, um, pretty much. So, um, and so there was always always an aspect of uh, um, uh, that it was uh, fasting was a non luxurious diet. It was it was not you you didn't manifest the luxury of of your wealth by when you ate a fasting diet, you you cut down to um, to the to the bare, bare essentials, and um, and of course the bread at the time was not this highly refined mm-hmm. stuff. It was it was um, uh, it was wheat bread or it was barley or oats or thing, things like that. It was a lot of whole grains, and uh, very it was very heavy and very nutritious. So. But not not as refined as, as our, uh, we have. So not a question, but a comment. Uh-huh. Um, at, with my past having been from Presbyterian roots, uh, there was no fasting ever. Right. So as you can imagine, when Mihaela first came to me and talked about fasting, I was like, hmm, this sounds interesting. I don't know. And then when she gave me the fasting food for the first time, I was like, oh my, is this what it is? I was like, I don't know if I can do this. Mm-hmm. But as anything, you know, I started opening my mind up more. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, um, as she was saying, and as I started thinking, I'm in my 40s now, I should eat more healthy anyway. And then I got started to realize, wait a second, maybe I am eating too much of this and too many meats and too many things that are not good for you. Right. So as this all opened my mind up to things of, you know, if anything, healthier living. Yeah. 
Um, so yeah, I mean, this is a blessing in a way. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, for in America, you know, we got things very different. Things are very different than they were in, you know, at at this time. You had um, you had the small proportion of the of the elite, and, and um, who could who had whatever they wanted. Mm -hmm. um, then there was then there were um, then there was kind of this upper class. There was no middle class, and there were the poor, and then there were the slaves. And the slaves got what they could scrounge, um, or were given by their masters, and the poor what they could eke out as a, as a living. Of course, eighty percent of the seventy percent of the population lived in the lived in the farms, eighty percent, um, and uh, uh, whereas for us, where ninety percent of the population is urban or suburban, um, and. Uh, and even even the poor among us are rich compared to the yeah. rest of the world. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you take what eighty seventy percent of the population of the world, and our poorest people are rich compared to them. Yeah, when I when we were in Mexico, I was like, wow, yeah. I yeah, I couldn't believe what I was seeing. Yeah, and so. Mexico is a wealthy country compared to some. Oh wow! Mm -hmm. Yeah, so yeah, um, so uh, so for us, it's. Uh, I, what do we do when we, we, we're fasting? We just go to a different aisle in the supermarket. <laughs> That's right, you know. And and so instead of instead of the you know the nice fancy you know nice cuts of meat, we go to the fish market and we get the shrimp and the crab and all of this stuff that's, you know, the clams and all of the the fathers the fathers thought were vegetables. And squid, octopus, um, and and if you lived if you lived very far from the coast, unless you were wealthy, I, you would never see a squid or an octopus or a clam or a, mm -hmm. something like that. Yeah. So um, it's a you know, and then of course it was it was it was. The Mediterranean diet was worked out by the Greeks at that point, and so, for example, as as I just said, um, invertebrates were classed as vegetables, um, and even even um, shrimp and things like well, all invertebrates, um, and so you can have those every day except Good Friday, basically, um, and uh, it just. It, I think I think in our culture people haven't we have a good idea about fasting but we don't know how to feast because every day we can have whatever we want and when it comes and it, when when it comes to fasting is is a fasting meal any cheaper than than a, than a feasting meal probably not yeah sometimes more expensive and so we're missing the whole point. Um, and so, or maybe not the whole point, but a good part of it. Um, so, what else? Did you said invertebrates are essentially vegetables? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so a, 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 according to the fasting rules, you can have Shrimp, crab, lobster, clams, squid, octopus, uh, virtually, and those are included in as fasting foods. Except fish with. Except fish with a bat with a backbone. Oh. Yeah. Uh, is there a way we can kind of take? Uh, how can we take as much as we can away from fasting when we fast, or does it kind of just do it on its own? You learn by fasting. You learn by fasting. Yeah, and uh, um, there's a there's a couple time there's a couple periods in the life of the church where they encourage a very strict fast. In other words, no eating. Um, and uh, the first is the first three days of Lent. So from um, uh, Forgiveness Sunday, you have the last meal. Um, that's, you know, 
or as we used to call it in seminary, cheesecake Sunday. Um, or you'd go out real late and have cheesecake at the diner, you know. Um, but from the last meal on, on Sunday, um, there's the tradition of eating nothing until Wednesday, after the pre-sanctified. So you fat, it's the whole, the whole thing becomes a preparation to receive communion on Wednesday of, at the first pre-sanctified. Um, uh, and uh, also some people will fast during Holy Week like that. They'll fast for the first three days. They'll even, they'll go to communion maybe Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, but, um, um, but otherwise they'll, uh, they'll fast. Many will just, will just not even go to communion um, and they'll go to communion on, on Holy Thursday. Um, and there's days like the uh, um, uh, beheading of St. John the Baptist, which is a, a strict fast day. Um, so, but when, like the first three days, um, you've, it's, a, it's a good way to start Lent if you can do it, because your mind becomes very clear after, you know, fasting for three days. Now, if you're under 25, I don't advise it. Um, it's, uh, you'll just fall over. <laughs> I've, I've seen too many kids just fall over. Um, because with a, with a uh, metabolism like a blast furnace. But once you get old, like 26, <laughs> um, <laughs> then it's a little easier. You can try, but... Yeah. So during this three-day period, there's literally nothing consumed. Yeah. Water, oh. maybe. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Now, not Where everybody do does that. Yeah. <laughs> not everybody no, does I'm that. I'm just curious because yeah, that doesn't sound. I don't know if it's. Again, I'm just learning things. So mm -hmm. in my mind, I comprehend, but mm -hmm. it's. I think of things like, okay, am I going to be okay on the second day? Am I going to be able to? Walk or mm -hmm. just well, this this remember this is a, a monastic ascetic practice that, that's normally done in monasteries. And if you're fasting like that, the only thing you're doing is going to services. Okay. Because you're not working a job. You're not working. You're okay. not driving. Thank God. Hopefully, yeah. um, you're not. You know. Um, yeah. You know. You don't want to be wrapped around a tree. Um, uh, um, but. All you're doing is going to going to church and going to your cell, and that's it. Um, you can't do that if you're. Uh, but it's not what laymen do. There are some laymen that do. Is it is that practice um, stem like in the Russian or the Greek? Or it's the, universal. I've never heard of going three days without. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, it's a universal practice. Now, among. You know, among those who are very pious. You know, people. One of the things in America, people. You know, one of the things in America, people have the idea is that there's a difference between monks and laymen. And there's not. There's no difference in the fasting rules. There's no difference in the um, liturgical order. Um, the th the same thing is prescribed for the monasteries as it is for the. Uh, um, uh, for the for the parishes and for the cathedrals, the liturgical order is identical. Thing is, the okay. parishes don't have the personnel to pull it off, for the most part. So, for example, um, a lot of churches, urban churches in in Greece or in Romania and Serbia, Bulgaria, uh, certainly in Russia um, and throughout the Orthodox world. Uh, will have the full daily cycle of services. They'll have liturg uh, matins and liturgy in the morning, and they'll have vespers in the evening. We don't get that here. What's that? We don't get that here. No. Everybody works. And everybody and everybody works. Well, they work there, too. And it's not like you have a full church during the middle of the week. Right. Um, but people will go. You know, there are those who don't work and who don't work during those hours, and so, um, and in Moscow, anyway. I mean, it's um, 
uh, St. Petersburg, the churches are busy all the time. Mm -hmm. And being a priest, being a priest is a, it's a very um, demanding job. Because, you know, it, it, parishes are structured differently there than they are here. Here they're, they're integral communities. There, they're just liturgical centers. There's a little community con connected to each one, usually the people who run things. But pe people go because they're nearby. So. You know, you go you go to McDonald's. It's close by. It's yeah. convenient. It it, it 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 seems it seems wrong somehow. Well, maybe they like the choir at one place. Maybe they like the sermons at another place. And maybe, maybe they need to go visit Grandma, and Grandma lives over in this part of town. And maybe you know, and maybe they don't. Um, maybe the services are shorter at one place, and they'll go there, or they're longer, and so that you can have the full thing. You know. The churches are on every corner over in the Orthodox countries. I forgot. Yeah. It's not like here where you drive 40 minutes to get to a church. Right. Yeah. yeah it's like just about every corner. Yeah. There's an old Russian saying that, um, what, what, of what use is a road if it doesn't have a church at the end of it? <laughs> and, uh, and, yeah. and, 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 you know, in the countryside, I mean, you would literally the roads would go from. One church to one village to the next village and from church to church. And so, yeah. uh, this is chapter 18. Uh, uh huh, you're jumping ahead. Oh, no, not chapter 18. Sorry. St uh, let us prove step, step 18. Step mm 18? -hmm. No, not step or, 18. Oh, yeah, um, chapter 18. Of, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Let us prune the stomach by thought of future fire. For some who are servants of their stomach have cut members right off and died a double death. If we go into the matter, we shall find that it's a stomach wound is a cause of all human strength. Is that a reference to, in Matthew, Christ talks about cutting off your members and throwing them into the fire? Yeah. 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 Uh, so was Christ talking about this type of... I've never really understood that verse. Well... He's, he, he, it's mentioned in a few different places. Well, this this is an obscure. Or a, um, um, it's a reference to origin. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> I get it. Who, who, yeah. Who castrated him? The story is he castrated himself, and and a lot of what this chapter is about is how gluttony incites the passions of lust. And that if you and if you cur and if and if you curb gluttony and if you and if and if you are are very careful about what you eat, it will it will um, uh, decrease the decrease the passions of lust. But if but but if you just totally indulge yourself, um, you won't be able to control your lust. So and so literal. Yes, <laughs> yes, and so. And so what he's, what he's saying is that, you know, there are some who, you know, um, you know, thought that they, you know, um, who slaves of their stomachs have cut their members right off. Well, okay. you know, it's, uh, um, yeah, which is uncanonical, by the way. So could it be that the, uh, as, as Christ said, he who is faithful in little is faithful also in much. Right. Therefore, if you're faithful in, in, in essentially controlling the stomach, you'll be also faithful in... Fighting the other passions. Right. Is, is, it, is it the same? It relates in, in the same in the same manner. Although that may not have been what was originally meant. Right. It applies in this situation. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Oh, back to the fish. So uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> I was. Um, I think the catechumen group was talking about this like app developed by someone in Russia, and it had like a list of a fasting calendar and comparing it to our church calendar they were more liberal with having fish on Wednesdays and mm -hmm. Fridays is that just like a regional variance well I mean there are the okay mm -hmm. remember the calendar has has several levels of or several things that affect it there's there's the uh, the general calendar um, you know where Wednesdays and Fridays are fast days and um, generally on Wednesdays and Fridays, um, 
Uh, that means a fast day means abstention from all animal products. In other words, all kinds of meat, which includes chicken and um, all kinds of fish, um, all kinds of dairy, eggs, and uh, wine and oil. Now, some 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 people are uh, will ex expand that to include all alcohol and all kinds of oil, and others will say no. Wine means wine, so li so liquor's okay. Um, and actually, that's that's monathos. Really? Yeah, yeah. And you, beer, beer too. Beer. And beer, of course. Uh, Fleecen's okay. Right? <laughs> beer, of course. Flowing bread. It feels like cheating, though. Well, actually, yeah. <laughs> actually, one one of the reasons beer was developed in certain certain ways was because you could drink it during Lent. Oh. And that became that became that became your food during Lent, because in certain many areas, beer the beer was as rich at, or richer than bread, so it was called flowing bread, um, and then. The oil, well, okay, these were Greeks, right? So it means olive oil. And so if it just means olive oil, um, you know, and, and a lot of Greek food is basically floating in olive oil. Mm -hmm. I'll never forget coming off of a vigil on Mount Athos and coming into Trapeze at 6 o'clock in the morning, right? Um, after being up most of the night with, at the service. And there is a fish staring up at me from a plate of congealed olive oil because <laughs> it was cold in the trapeze. You know? um, uh, uh, so that's one meaning of it. Um, but uh, is, it, is it just olive oil? So canola oil, walnut oil, all these other things. Is that kosher? Besides, who's ever heard of a canola? You know? Um, and um, so they, they, didn't, they didn't know about canolas or peanut oil in, in the time of the fathers, so it must be kosher, right? They didn't know about distilled liquor either, it hadn't been invented yet. So. Yeah, okay. So, um, so you can't ha don't have to fast from it, right? Or you've got the super, the, so the super strict are saying, yes, fasting from oil means fasting from olive oil. And fasting from wine means fasting from wine. But liquor's okay. <laughs> Canola oil's okay or whatever. Um, and then there, then there are those who um, want to be strict in another way and say, no, it means all alcohol and all oil. Well, try fasting for, with from all oil. No butter, no margarine, no... It's very great. It's, no, it's, no peanut butter. It's, 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 it's no peanut butter. Which is all oil. It's all oil. Yeah. Well, but you can use the peanut oil because it's peanuts. You got all. Yeah, but you grind up the peanuts. That's peanut butter. It's not peanut oil. Uh huh. But I'm talking about you know. Um, try, I'm trying. I'm trying to talk about those who invoke the spirits into into the law <laughs> and not live according to this just the spirit of the law, and so and that so they turn it in, but. Anyway, it, um, so that rule um, is, uh, is called dry eating, serophagia. And, um, uh, and, so, and it's very dry. If you have no butter, margarine, oil, any peanut butter, anything on your bread, it's dry. And you drink water, okay? Maybe coffee and tea. But in Russia, they're not too fond of coffee in certain places, so well, some think, of the monasteries, especially. Uh, in Russia, they teach us, like the priests, uh, they teach us how to distinguish between what you're supposed to consume during the uh, fasting and what you're not to. Just you have to see if it's come from, uh, if it comes from a uh, live being, a alive being, you know, mm -hmm. like uh, oil, milk, butter. But if it comes from a plant, then mm -hmm. it's okay. And uh, on Thursdays, it would be an exception for seafood. Ah. <laughs> okay. Well, there's yeah, there's and well, that's a that's a local variation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there's all these local variations, national variations. But then there's also on if on the calendar, 
Um, there are multiple feast days. Um, and every day has the commemoration of certain saints. So um, if you have a major saint, like St. Anthony, <laughs> or St. Nicholas, or St. Um, it may be a fish, wine, and oil day. So, um, so the fact, the fa even if it's Friday, um, you can have fish, you can have wine and oil, uh, which is a whole lot different than, than the Xerophagia. Whereas if, if it's St. Paphnutius of the Swamp, that nobody's ever heard of for the past 1,500 years. <laughs> um, it's probably not going to be any lessening of the fasting rules. Then there's another category, which is just wine and oil for a certain, certain feasts. <laughs> then then um, there's uh, the resurrection of Lazarus, Lazarus Saturday, where the... Um, uh, they don't, it, technically you're not permitted fish, but you're permitted caviar. Wow. Um, now caviar in our culture means, you know, it means really, you know, really luxurious food. But in most of East European culture, caviar is just, is, is just fish eggs, <laughs> yeah. you know, and it's, it's very common, chagro. Things like that, and salmon. So, yeah. Um, it just seems so easy to become legalistic and lose the, the mindset of what you open with moderation. And, and, mm -hmm. um, it, it seems as if, if we were to take it too legalistically, we would be sinning. We can make, we can, we can, we can out Pharisee the Pharisees. Right, right. And it's, and that's a big problem. And it's especially a big it's it's especially a big temptation with converts, yeah. people who've grown up with it. They kind of have the, they have kind of have the feel of it, and many of them and many people, um, especially who've who've you know taken it seriously all their lives from the time they were children even into their eighties and nineties, you know still, even though el you know quite elderly people are. Um, uh, absolved from having to, you know, keep the fasting rules. They still do it because they can't imagine living any other way. Um, and and so um, it, it just it just becomes a way of life, um, and you don't even think about it. Whereas new converts, <laughs> that's all you can think about <laughs> during Lent. What can I have? What can I not have? And why am I so hungry? <laughs> you know? Of course, today every other kid you meet is a vegan anyway. And that's right. <laughs> they do that all the time for totally different meals. Yeah, but yeah. vegans use oil, so that doesn't, it doesn't work. It's like you still have that can I count? Okay. Yeah. Some so, vegans eat cheese. So. Mm -hmm. Is the summation uh, coming from uh, the last paragraph, 36, that the gluttony is essentially like a gateway towards all the other passions, so start there first. Yep. Well, you can't start there first. I will. You notice yeah. the ladder does not start with gluttony. Of course. <laughs> um, because, it's, because it's one of the hardest to deal with. Okay. Um, uh, and, but it, and it's a perpetual battle. Um, some of the others, you know, they, they'll... they'll grip us for a while, you know, a certain period of our life, and then we get over it and move on to something else. Um, but gluttony, the same thing with lust. It's, it's something that's there uh, basically until our dying day that has to be battled with. And they have, they have stories um, either here or in others, uh, uh, writings of the Desert Fathers, talking about this this 80 year old bishop and you know in the, in the Roman period of the early Roman Empire mid Roman Empire 80 years old was really 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 old and um, talk about he was um, sick and being taken care of by nuns but all of a sudden he had a resurrection <laughs> and they got a child <laughs> so um as it were. <laughs> so you have to be you have to be watchful. Is the whole point. It's the whole point. 
So, anything else? I was just going to add the, uh, what you forgot. Sometimes the passions fight against each other, so you can hit one against the other. And mm -hmm. It's like making beetles fight. Yep. And then you just stand by and watch. How do you make one passion fight against another? It's like vanity versus gluttony. So it's like a, one evil is food, but uh, it's like. I want people to think I'm righteous by fasting, or I don't want to be fat, and I don't think I'm attractive, or something like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. And sometimes that doesn't work. <laughs> so, some, some of us can be vainglorious as well. <laughs> uh, so, um, but yeah, I mean, it's. Um, Pitting vainglory and and gluttony or vainglory and, and I mean, you know, one of what, just one of the, one of the things is they talk about is um, um, uh, in your vainglory it keeps you from falling into certain passions because you you can't imagine uh, confessing it to your confessor. <laughs> so in order to so the vainglory keeps you from from falling into other sins because you don't want to tell your confessor that you did that. 